As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play I Live the Life I Love from one of the mask and wig productions of the University of Pennsylvania. Cavalcade moves forward. Seventy years before the American Revolution, Benjamin, youngest son of Josiah and Obiah Franklin, was born January 17, 1706, on Milk Street in one of the largest towns of the colonies, Boston, Massachusetts, whose population then was about 10,000. Sixteen years later, in the printing press of his elder brother James, under mysterious circumstances, he began the literary career that was to last over 60 years. It is early in the morning. Benjamin is starting the day's work as Collins, another apprentice, discovers a folded paper shoved under the door. Look here, Ben. Another letter from Mr. Silence Dugood. Leave it on the ground for my brother to find. I wonder what the old dame's writ this time. The whole towns are talking about her pieces in the paper. <laughs> Wait until they read this one. It'll give those empty heads in Harvard a good rattling. How do you know, Ben? Have you read it already? 
As a matter of fact, Collins, I wrote it myself. Uh, in a disguised hand yeah, like Ben. Oh, another missive from our mistress, Silence Do Good. Well, read it, James. I'm a gob with curiosity to see what she'll scold about next. Yes, so am I. I'm afraid I'll have a lot of danger. Go about your work, boys. Yes, this is not for young ears. Yeah, hmm. Harken to this. She's writing of people who send their sons to Harvard. She says, Most of them consulted their own purses instead of their children's capacities. And most part of those who were traveling thither were a little better than blockheads and dunces. Well, <laughs> well she's out of here. <laughs> Have you any suspicion who she may be, James? Well, some say she's a disgruntled spinster, and others that she's the widow of a minister with a young son in Harvard. I published two appeals to her to reveal herself, but... Uh, Benjamin, where is that paper with the last advertisement for Mistress Dugood? Uh, she was here this morning, was she not, Colin? Uh, uh, what? She was here? In fact, brother, she is still here. What impudent nonsense are you talking? I... I say that Silence Dugood is hiding in this room. Well, where is she? Behind my leather apron. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> You young rascal! <laughs> In fact, my worthy brother, Mr. Silence Do Good is none other than myself, Benjamin Franklin. What? Whose articles and witty comments you have published and praised. It's quite true, Mr. Franklin. Benjamin wrote them himself in a disguised hand. Why? Well, look out there! There's my friend! Oh, look out there! Oh, hey, that all! Oh, oh, you young good for nothing and that all! Oh, 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 stealing oh, my time! Oh, dear, you it's breaking Franklin. your work! Oh. Seeking yourself the high enough. young cockalora! Oh, are you oh, there? Oh, and there! Oh, and there! Oh, that will teach you a lesson. Oh. You beat me all you want now, James. But someday I'll run away from here. I'll have myself a newspaper of my own that everyone will want to read. Not long afterwards... Benjamin Franklin did run away to Philadelphia, and before long he was publishing his own newspaper and the famous Poor Richard Almanac. We find him now at 26, the most widely read and quoted writer in the colonies. He has his own printing shop and is married. With his busy body commentary on current events, he has become the first columnist in America. Still wearing his red flannel shirt and leather apron, he trundles his paper through Market Street in a wheelbarrow to his little shop, where we find his young wife, Deborah, stitching bindings and tending counter. Open the door for me, Debbie. Oh, oh how you do look, Benjamin, trotting that paper through the street on a wheelbarrow like a common apprentice. It's a very good example. Brings attention to my industry and pleases the merchants and good folk who buy my paper. Uh-huh. You never did have a care to your looks. Well, do I remember the first time I ever saw you walking along the street with two great sticks of bread poked out of your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you think when you laughed at me then that I was going to be the town's most successful printer and journalist. Hey, Debbie. You've proved to everyone what you could make of yourself, Ben. Even your own family. That brother James of yours who beat you so and drove you to run away from Boston. Really? I owe James a great deal. I often fancy his harsh and tyrannical treatment was the means of impressing me with that aversion to arbitrary power that has stuck to me. Come in. Oh, William. Good day to you, Master Coleman. Good day to you both. Come in, William. What's the news with you? I stopped by to go with you to the Junto. And uh, I've just finished reading your almanac, Ben. Uh Oh? Everyone is laughing at its humor and praising your good sense. I particularly like this saying... Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Aye, and he himself never gets more than six hours sleep, Mr. Coleman. Oh, truly, Mistress Franklin. Remember, mm. Debbie, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. Oh, oh be <laughs> still, Pappy. Leave poor Richard out of it. <laughs> but he did say there are three faithful friends, an old wife, an old dog, and ready money. And he has neither dog, nor ready money, and neither am I old. <laughs> if I could write just for my readers instead of my wife. She takes them all to herself, poor Debbie. Now, who may this be? Come in. 
Good day to you, sir. A good day to you. My name is Frank Pierce. I've traveled up from the Carolinas to see Benjamin Franklin, publisher of the Gazette and the Poor Richard's Almanac. Why, he's the young man in the leather apron who let you in. This young man, the famous Mr. Franklin? I'm glad to welcome you, sir. This is uh, my friend, Mr. William Coleman. How, How do you do, do Mr. Pierce? And my wife, Mr. Deborah Franklin. How do you Mr. do, sir? Franklin, you say you have heard of Poor Richard in the Carolina Colony? Oh, yes, indeed, sir. People say today there are two books you may find in every man's family. The Bible and Poor Richard's Almanac. Well. I know Richard by heart myself. He's my daily guide. A penny saved is a penny earned. When thieves fall out, honest men get their due. Uh, three moves as bad as the fire. Necessity never made a good bargain. <laughs> there, you see, sir, they're well known to me. Oh. And also, you said, if you would have your business done, go. If not, send and that is why I've come to see you myself. And rightly so. Well, what may I do for you, my friend? Well, we have very few printing presses in our colony south. I've heard that you, sir, have invented your own matrix, that you carve your own woodcuts and even mix your own inks. Well, I would learn from you something of our craft. You see, I want to establish my own printing shop as soon as I have the means. Perhaps I may be able to help you do that. We should all help one another. My friend here helped me to get me my first start. Mankind is all one family after all, and goodwill should prevail. If I help you, you in turn may help the next one, and so on in an endless chain of friendly kindness and aid. I don't like to hurry you, Ben, but we're due at the Junto. Oh. The Junto, Mr. Pierce, is composed of young men like ourselves, mostly leather aprons and no fuss of feathers. We meet each Friday for mutual entertainment and counsel. Tonight, I believe, I have something of importance to present for discussion. Aye, Ben. Every night you have something of importance to present. Truly, Master Pierce, his is the finest mind in the colonies. At one of the Junto meetings... The first public library in America was born from the fertile mind of Benjamin Franklin. Through his energy and genius came the first organized volunteer fire department, the first police system, the first move toward paved and lighted city streets, the first city hospital, the University of Pennsylvania, and the American Philosophical Society. At the age of 42, Franklin had worked hard, saved his money, and sold out his business all that he might be able to retire and pursue his scientific studies and experiments. We find him now at the beautiful home he had built for his family out on the banks of the Delaware River. After seven years of happy retirement with his children and Deborah, he is absorbed in his new experiment with electricity in the air. For pity's sake, Pappy, what's that noise? My bells, Debbie, my bells. A thunderstorm is brewing. I have wire strung for my lightning rod to give the warning. And it came. Oh, more silly things with your experiments. Mr. Beach said at the meeting the other day that your lightning rod was a tinkering with providence. And I'll never forget how you made it all ridiculous running around the cow pasture with William after a kite. A man of your age and dignity. Ah, Debbie, if you only knew what my little kite proved that day. Didn't the King of France send me a personal letter commending those first experiments? <sighs> I should think you'd tire of sticking around the house, tinkering with wires and whatnot, when you could be at the very top of your trade. These last ten years have been the most successful and productive years of my entire life. And the happiest, I might say. You see? Here comes my storm. I've answered, Debbie. Good evening to you, Mr. Franklin. Good evening. And to you, Mr. Franklin. Good evening, Mr. Curtis. Yes. Seems to be gathering for rain. <laughs> did you bring the storm with you, Mr. Curtis, or did the storm bring you? <laughs> I'm afraid there is more than one storm brewing tonight, my friend, and one that is not of the elements. I have only just come from the assembly. They have named two commissioners to leave at once for England to present their grievance against the Penn family taxation to the king. Hmm. They still claim exemption through the old Indian treaty. <laughs> But there's a later one, I'm certain. Mr. Franklin, the Assembly feels that you know more about this matter than anyone. 
And also, you're acquainted in England for your from your early days. Your position as Postmaster General gives you authority to represent us over there. And tonight, you have been appointed Commissioner with Mr. Isaac Norris, Speaker of the Assembly. Oh. Let Norris go. I have my scientific work here laid out for years to come. And I have retired. A man cannot retire from the service of his country when his aid is needed. We ask you not to decline this appointment. It's a crucial time, Mr. Franklin. Listen to my lightning bells, Curtis. You know, I proved positively when I looked down my lightning rod that several inches had been burned at the top. Yet our house was never harmed during the last storm. Every house should have one. The Speaker Norris has said that he cannot go. You'll be gone only a short time. You're not going to England, Pappy, surely. I must, Debbie. They will make me the lightning rod to divert the Penn family out. Oh, dear. It's all right. We're perfectly safe. I love a good storm. But I don't want you to go without me, Pappy. And you know I'm afraid of the sea. I shall only be gone a few months, my dear. Only a few months. A few months became ten years and a half. Except for one brief visit home, Benjamin Franklin remained in England as the principal representative of the American colonies during the crucial period before the Revolutionary War. He helped bring about the repeal of the Stamp Act, and he sought a peaceful solution to the increasing bad feeling between the colonies and the mother country. He returned in 1775, believing his mission a failure. His beloved wife had died the previous winter but he is tenderly greeted by his daughter, Sally, who is living in his old home on the Delaware with her family. We never disturbed anything here or in your library, Father. Mother wouldn't let us. She was always expecting you back. And I was always expecting to come back to her, my child. Sit here, dear. Ah, the same old chair. Yes. How it fits me. Oh, Father... I am always accompanied now, Sally, by my faithful gout. It never deserts me. Tell me of your voyage home, dear. Was it very rough this time? Terrible. I shall never cross the ocean again. But I made some amazing observations, Sally. There is a warm stream of water I have discovered. Almost a great sweeping river that flows directly to the Atlantic Ocean and causes the mild climate of England. But, Daddy, how did you ever find that out? I devised my own method of sounding with a thermometer at varying depths. I call it the Gulf Stream. Wonderful. And tell me about visiting Europe. They say you were fated and acclaimed everywhere. And you met kings and queens and statesmen and scientists. Oh, I was so proud of you, Daddy. Well, mm -hmm. I'm glad. You know, uh, they're using my lightning rod now on Buckingham Palace. And the Queen's Palace, and on the Ducal Palace in Venice, who besides many, many more all over Europe. They call me the uh, Thunder Master. The Thunder Master. <laughs> and how Mother used to scold about your little bells. <laughs> she was very patient with my tinkering about the house. But it all came to good use, Sally. Now I have been elected to the Royal Society of London, and the Royal Academy in Paris, and the Society of Experimental Science in Leiden. That little string of my kite has led me a long flight. Well, Father, it's right that they should all honor you. They were all very nice to me. Who's that? Oh, just the children, Father. Go and play at the end of the garden, children. Don't stop them, my dear. I enjoy hearing my grandchildren's voices. What was that song they were singing? Something that started in Boston after the tea party. Everyone is singing it now. Since Lexington and Concord more than ever. A message for Mr. Franklin. Whoever that may be, I won't let you be disturbed, Father. My father is resting, sir. He only returned yesterday from a long voyage from England. I am to deliver this to him at once, Mrs. Bates. Uh, bring me the message, Sally. As you wish, Daddy. 
here. Thank you. Oh, it looks important. What do they want of you, Daddy? Oh, yes. Ah, yes. This is imperative, my dear. Hmm. I have been chosen as one of Pennsylvania's five delegates to the Continental Congress. They are organizing for war against England. But you're too old, Father. Old and probably good for nothing. But as the storekeepers say of their remnants of cloth, I am but a fag end, and you may have me for what you please. Oh, my old friend Colonel Washington has been named commander-in-chief of the army. I cannot refuse to give my services at his command. One later, in September 1776, with the American cause facing defeat for lack of funds and supplies, the Continental Congress unanimously elected Ben Franklin as special commissioner to France, whose alliance he was instrumental in securing. It was nine years before he set foot on his native shore again. On September 14, 1785, he arrives home on the London packet. Beloved and renowned... He has been named the first American citizen. Cheering crowds swarmed the same old Market Street in Philadelphia where he had arrived 60 years before as a runaway apprentice. The Committee of Welcome is waiting for Dr. Franklin in the ship's cabin. He did more to win the war than any one man. Oh, what about Washington? And where, I ask you, sir, would Washington and the rest of us have been if Dr. Franklin hadn't persuaded King Louis to the smart tune of 26 million francs? Quiet, here he comes. Welcome, thrice welcome, Dr. Franklin, to your native land again. God is be praised and thanked for all men. Are you satisfied with the peace terms, Doctor? There never was a good war or a bad peace. What kind of a voyage did you have this time, sir? Dreadful? Dreadful. I was in my cabin most of the time, writing on a new paper, the cause and door of smoky chimneys. Doctor, we are electing you chairman of the Philadelphia Common Council, and you will undoubtedly be chosen later for the highest office in the state. Yes. Yes, they have eaten my flesh, and it seems they are resolved to pick my bones. Uh, perhaps you would all like to hear my epitaph. Oh, I'm sure you have many years before you, Doctor. I, uh, I amuse myself by writing it. I seem to have intruded myself into the company of posterity when I ought to have been abed and asleep. <laughs> the body of Benjamin Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. Yet the work itself shall not be lost, for it will, as he believes, appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition, corrected and amended by the author. Franklin never realized his ambition to retire from active public life. After his return, he served Pennsylvania as chief executive of the state, filling that office on three occasions, and taking active part in the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in Philadelphia. Until his death on April 17, 1790, at the age of 84, he never ceased his scientific labors, writing incessantly on his pamphlets and books for the improvement and betterment of mankind. No American ever led a more useful and productive life than Benjamin Franklin, first citizen in the cavalcade of America. When Benjamin Franklin was in France, he often visited the laboratory of the famous French scientist, Lavoisier, 
where a young man named Eleuther Irene Dupont was working. Later, this young man emigrated to America, and in 1802, he established the Dupont Company on the banks of the Brandywine Creek in Delaware. Tonight, one of his great-grandsons is with us in the studio, Mr. Irene Dupont, vice chairman of the Dupont Company's board of directors, who continues the association between the names Franklin and Dupont through his service on the board of managers of the Franklin Institute, Philadelphia, which this week is dedicating a national shrine to Franklin's memory. Mr. Dupont, if Benjamin Franklin, as he suggested in his own epitaph, were to return today, what accomplishments of DuPont chemical research do you think would interest him most? Benjamin Franklin was very much interested in agriculture. He carried on experiments in improving the productiveness of his farm near Burlington, New Jersey, especially by means of up rotation and liming the soil. Franklin would be astonished at the present great production of chemical fertilizers, the more so because no one of his time dreamed that nitrogenous fertilizers could be made from such raw materials as air and water. It would amaze him to visit the DuPont plant at Bell, West Virginia, where this complicated process is carried on at pressures as high as 13,000 pounds per square inch. And he'd be pleased that products so valuable to agriculture can be produced by this chemical route at a lower price than by any other. Uh, Mr. DuPont, uh, what other chemical discoveries would Franklin regard as important contributions to better living? I think the observant Franklin would be astonished at the low cost of modern coal tar dyes and equally astonished at their brilliancy and fastness or ability to resist fading. Twenty-five years ago, America was almost entirely dependent on Europe for dyestuffs. Now the DuPont Company and other American manufacturers produce dyes equal to any others produced elsewhere. And the dyestuffs industry has given us other things besides dyes, hasn't it, Mr. DuPont? Yes, indeed. Chemists found that the same processes or raw materials used in making dyes would also yield an endless variety of so-called organic chemicals. One of the most widely used of these is tetraethyl lead, the compound that takes the knockout of gasoline. Other organic chemicals supplied by the DuPont Company to rubber companies help make our present-day automobile tires last three or four times as long as the tires of a few years ago. This calls to mind the new man-made material, neoprene, a compound very like rubber, but in certain ways eminently superior to rubber. All natural rubber comes from tropical countries thousands of miles away, but neoprene is produced by DuPont chemists from coal, limestone, and salt, a great advantage to this country should our supply of natural rubber ever be cut off. A somewhat similar case is camphor, essential to the plastics industry. This material was formerly imported from the Orient, where it was obtained from camphor trees. Today, DuPont produces camphor from southern pine trees at a price that frees us from a threat of foreign control. Mr. DuPont, it's easy to see that chemistry has come a long way since Franklin's time. What do you see for the future? No one can tell just what new developments will emerge from research laboratories. In Franklin's time, progress was slow, for even such a genius as he worked largely alone and had very limited facility. Today, research chemists work in cooperating groups in well-equipped laboratories, and have available the accumulated knowledge of those who have preceded them. Though we cannot predict the specific results of their labors, it's certain that we have only begun to uncover the possibilities. The most important point is that all these new industries, born of chemical research, provide jobs for thousands of people and produce an endless stream of new and better products for our comfort and convenience. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. The facts you've brought out throw new light on the work that the DuPont Company is carrying forward to create better things for better living through chemistry. Child Welfare, a story of the growth of an organization in this country devoted to improving methods of caring for children and understanding juvenile problems, will be the subject of our broadcast next week at the same time DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, being through chemistry. Millions of American men and women who have labored, and today labor still, with hand and mind and heart, to build and to preserve a great free nation. The Cavalcade of America proudly dedicates the unending story of a new way of life in a new world. The Cavalcade of America presents the story of the greatest triumph in American diplomacy. Our radio play, Dr. Franklin Goes to Court, has been especially written for this series by Eric Barno. Starring in the role of Benjamin Franklin is John McIntyre of the Cavalcade Players. The part of John Adams is played by Ray Collins. Vergen by Carl Swenson. Benny by Sarah Fussell. King Louis XVI by George Caloris. The Wig Dresser by Elliot Reed. And Silas Dean by Kenneth Delmar. Our orchestra and original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Dr. Franklin Goes to Court as our drama on the Cavalcade of America. September night in the year 1776, at a small inn in New Brunswick, New Jersey, two gentlemen, by the light of a lamp, follow the innkeeper to an upstairs room. One is John Adams, the other Benjamin Franklin. This is the room, gentlemen. Oh, but this will never do. This uh, one bed. Uh, show us something else, please. I just told you it's the only room we have. But heavens, man. Adams, if we two corpulent fellows are to sleep in that one bed, I fear we must pack ourselves rather closely. Oh, it's out of the question. Innkeeper, you must show us another room. Well, I've told you we're full. All day the roads have been crowded with men going to join Washington's army. Indeed. Is that so? Yes, I don't know what it's all about. There's trouble blue brewing in this land, I know that. One man showed me some handbill he had from Philadelphia. Some declaration or other. Declaration of independence? I don't know. All I know is they keep coming through here, and you gentlemen are lucky I can even give you this one bed. Well, Adams, the next inn is too far away for my gouty bones. I fear we must make the best of it. Dreadful. Thank you, innkeeper. We'll take a room. Sleep well, gentlemen. Room's hardly large enough to hold the bed. And the bed creaks like my bones. A place to hang one's clothes. Adams, it may ease you to reflect that here are the lowly beginnings of American diplomacy. A few weeks ago, these states proclaimed themselves before all the world free and independent. And here is one of their first diplomatic missions. Two bulky gentlemen in one inadequate bed on their way to a hopeless peace conference with an English commander. Well, not hopeless, Doctor. Well, almost hopeless. Washington's army is desperately situated. He can never hold New York. All the cards are in English hands. What can we expect from a peace conference with Lord Howe. I fear before we're through, we'll have to seek help elsewhere. The whole thing makes this bedroom so exasperating. I did want a good night's sleep so that my head would be clear tomorrow. Your head will be clear, all right. We'll just open this window. Oh, don't, uh, Dr. Franklin, please, uh, shut the window. What's the matter? Uh, the night air, I can't endure it. Please, I'm susceptible to cold. Oh, nonsense. Come on to bed. Air will do us good. But I'll catch cold. No, you won't. Obviously, Adams, you're not familiar with my theory on coals. Now, if you followed my writings, you'd know about it. Now, get into bed, and I'll explain it to you. Then leave that window alone. Well, all right, but it's 
seems risky. Yeah, I'm so tired, this bed feels good. Oh. Now, my theory on Coles, Adams, is simply this. I... Yes? You know, my theory is that cold air has no connection with coals. Air is good for you, even if it's night air. And cold comes from... comes from... Uh, Now then, uh, gentlemen, uh, may we come to the business of this conference? Indeed, yes. By all means, my lord. This is a crucial hour. Gentlemen, your rebel army is outnumbered and in great peril. You, Dr. Franklin, with your brilliant logical mind, will understand the danger that faces it. Indeed, my lord. Yet I rejoice that at this hour His Majesty's government offers a generous peace. We shall be happy to hear it. The offer is that if the colonies will immediately cease their insurrection, the Crown will pardon the rebellion and joyfully forgive its subjects. Lord Howe, you've burned our towns. You've brought foreign mercenaries to massacre peaceful citizens. And now you propose to forgive us. You express yourself ardently, Dr. Franklin. My Lord, clearly you do not yet know the free people with whom you deal. If the terms are not accepted, the war must go on. It would grieve me deeply to see these colonies go down in war. We will do our utmost to spare you of that grief. Uh, am I late for the meeting? I'm just beginning. Dr. Franklin, I waited here for you. The Congress has made an important decision. Yes? You and other envoys are to go at once to Paris. Well, with my 70 years' accumulation of gout... Only you could make this mission succeed. What is the mission? To make an alliance with France. We all know the secret supplies she's sending are not enough. We must make an open alliance. Uh, do you know what you're proposing? Well, how do you mean? I'm to visit a land of royalty. Of dukes and powdered wigs and medieval trappings. And I'm to say to them, we're having a revolution. We want to overthrow everything you stand for. Won't you help us? Yes, I know, I know. That's why we ask you. Only you could do it. Mm. <laughs> well, my young grandsons and I might enjoy a trip to Paris. Yes, particularly Benny. I'll take them along. Uh, they say that French foreign minister, the Comte de Vergennes, they say he's a sly fox. So are you, Dr. Franklin. Gentlemen. Monsieur le Comte. How do you do, sir? Dr. Franklin, I am... Happy to meet the great man who tamed the lightning. Taming the lightning was easy compared to my present task. Dr. Franklin, you must realize that I cannot receive you as a diplomat. And I can only assume that you did not receive my letter at the boat. Then I hope, Monsieur Le Comte, you will forgive me for leaving you with that assumption. Mm. I tried to convey a suggestion that your landing in France would be unwise, that it might create embarrassment. I do not feel embarrassed, Monsieur Le Comte. You do not seem to be. Uh, you see, Dr. Franklin, in the eyes of our English friends, France cannot be befriend agents of rebels. The English ambassador made that quite clear to me. He did, eh? Yeah, quite clear. Uh, my letter explained it thoroughly. Uh, you see... Monsieur Le Comte, I came here hoping 
to discuss an alliance of France and America uh, against England. Well, if uh, America should defeat England and thus make France the most powerful nation in Europe, naturally we would not mind. And we shall continue to help you secretly with money and supplies. But an alliance, impossible. Mm. Uh, could we obtain an audience with His Majesty to discuss this matter? There can be no point to it. His Majesty is wisely influenced by our leaders of thought. I see you agree with our old adage. A word to the wise is sufficient. It is a very clever saying, Dr. Franklin. But I cannot advise you, and I cannot receive you again. Our friends, the English, watch us closely. And so goodbye, monsieur. Good day, monsieur le Comte. Good day, sir. That was quickly settled. Yeah. Dean. Yes? He spoke of the leaders of thought, didn't he? Yes. Have you ever been to a salon, Dean? I don't even know what they are. Uh, very important institutions in French life, salons. Mm. We're going to meet beautiful ladies. Uh, but we have work to do. And we're going to do important business. Very interesting things, salons. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Franklin, but I must say good night now. Good night, my boy. And before I go, Dr. Franklin, I should like to tell you that at the first news of your great struggle in America, my heart was enrolled in it. Marquis de Lafayette, I shall always remember that. And I shall always be grateful to you for bringing me to this salon. Oh, not at all, Dr. Franklin. And when you see your father-in-law, pray convey my respects and my... Appreciation for his introducing me to so many excellent Frenchmen here in Paris. He's done me a great service. Good night, my boy. Good night. Good night, monsieur. Dr. Franklin. Oh, Dr. Franklin, you are deserting us. Uh, fair ladies, you give me no hope. I do give you hope, monsieur. Uh, but no certain hope. And I can only say the merry chase you ladies are leading me is responsible for my pitiful condition. What pitiful condition, <laughs> monsieur? Why? my gout. <laughs> How can we ladies be the cause of your gout, monsieur? And when I was a young man, the fair sex showed me many more favors than they do today. And then I had no gout. I can only conclude that the love of fair ladies wards off the gout. When the ladies desert us, gout takes possession. <laughs> but now I perceive my fellow countryman, Mr. Dean, is looking at me most disapprovingly. I fear it's time to go home. Oh, mais non, monsieur. I fear I must. Good night, lady. Good night. Well, Dean? Dr. Franklin, such appalling frivolity, making eyes at perfumed ladies. Dr. Franklin, we have work to do. And we're doing it. Clearly, you don't yet understand the role of the salon. But from these salons, opinion radiates. There are only a few hundred men in France whose opinions matter. And we're going to reach those men, Dean. I met some publishers tonight. And soon our cause will be in print. We're going to write pamphlets and we're going to salons tomorrow night and the next and the next. We'll create opinion for America. <laughs> Ambassador from England. Your lordship, I am charmed to see you. Count de Vigeram, I come to register a firm protest against the activities of one Dr. Franklin, the toleration of whose insidious practices by this court cannot be considered neutral on your part. To what can you refer? A network of intrigue is set up to create a sentimental attachment to the virtues of rebel America. Have you seen his newest pamphlet? Uh, no. I will leave it with you. Furthermore, Arms are smuggled to America from French ports, purchased on I know not what security, for I can assure you the rebels have no funds. For your government to countenance all this endangers our good relations. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, steps will be taken. I would not 
for the world endanger the friendship between our nations. Uh, by the way, I hear that Lord Howe has captured Philadelphia. Congratulations, monsieur. <laughs> So there we are. No more shipments of arms, no more pamphlets. By order of the Count de Vergine. How can we now continue our work? Do you suppose it's true Lord Howe has captured Philadelphia? I fear it is. I wonder what's happened to General Washington. I don't know. But till the tide turns, we're doomed to a sort of backdoor diplomacy. Uh, we're not to be received and we're watched by spies. Undoubtedly. We're probably surrounded by them, English and French. You ask me, we should employ still more spies. Let's play this game the way they play it. No, 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 just a moment. These gentlemen here have been playing that game for hundreds of years. I'm afraid our skill would be wanting. Uh, we do better to pursue a policy of honest innocence. Against unprincipled foxes? Roguery can often be best confounded by simple honesty. Listen... If we can be sure that all messages we send become known somehow to both the English and the French, perhaps this can be very useful to us. In what way? I have many friends in England. Suppose I wrote one of them a letter. It wouldn't matter much if it never reached him, provided it reached King Louis. Ah. What would you say in this letter? Well, something like this. Dear so-and-so, my envoys and I have carefully considered your proposal that England and America come to terms at once and that America should, in return for her independence, aid England in taking the French West Indies from France. The proposal seems to us at the moment not quite honorable, even though I may say some Americans would favor such a development. What an idea, Dr. Franklin. I think when King Louis' spies take in this letter, it will make the hair of his wig stand on end. Your Majesty. Uh, yes, Virgin. Uh, you recall we discussed an alliance between France and America suggested by Dr. Franklin? Ah, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin. Why must everyone keep talking of Dr. Franklin and his clever epigrams and brilliant pamphlets? All I hear is Franklin and America. I wish to remind you of that alliance. Well, then we don't want that alliance. Why should we ally ourselves with some rebels that are being chased all over America? Ah, but the course of battle has changed. An entire English army under Burgoyne has surrendered at Saratoga. Really? Really? I'm glad to hear it. I'd like to see the English get beaten. Of course, I'd like to see their rebels get beaten, too. Well, uh, after all, they're fighting against the king. Virgin, I'd like to see both sides lose this war. It begins to look as though France might lose this war. France? How is that possible? England, alarmed at the cost of the war is offering America terms of peace. Well, how does this affect us? America, in return for her independence, is asked to help England steal Your Majesty's West Indies. My West Indies? But that's terrible. What can we do? There's only one course open. Ah, oh, those villains. But then, I, I'm furious about this. My West Indies. An outrage, Your Majesty. It's treachery, treachery. Well, should we enter the war? Should we join America? Ah, but they, they, they are rebels. Virginia, what do our leaders of thought think uh, of America? America is on every tongue. It's become to them an exciting legend. Really? Ah, that frightens me, Virgin. I suppose I, I must decide. Ah, oh, Virgin, if I only knew what to do. Sire, I think the time has come for you to extend a court invitation to Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Franklin, I have good news for you. Indeed? His Majesty has at length decided after these weeks of deliberation that he cannot refuse all possible aid to a people struggling for liberty. A noble decision. And he will avow the alliance by receiving you and your fellow envoys at court. Then at last America enters the world of diplomacy by the front door. <laughs> My young grandsons will be excited about this. But you know, of course, Doctor, that uh, the court reception means formal court attire. You mean I must wear a wig? Yes, Monsieur. Court regulations. Oh, what a cruel blow. Just when everything was going so nicely. <laughs> It's your grandson, Dr. Frank. Oh, uh, Benny, Benny, come in, my boy, come in. How are you getting along, Grandpa? Are you almost ready? Well, you'd better ask His Excellency the wig dresser. It seems to me we're getting nowhere. We've had such tugging and pulling and... No! Oh. Is he almost ready, sir? Uh, young man, if you could persuade your grandfather to sit still, we should be ready in a very short time. But how can I get this wig arranged if he constantly squirms? Monsieur, you have been belaboring that wig for almost an hour. Hours. I cannot help it, Monsieur Doctor. It will not arrange itself correctly. Well, let me see. Oh, my. It doesn't look at all like Mr. Dean's. It doesn't, eh? Yeah? Oh, he's downstairs parading around the garden. Oh, he looks beautiful, just like a duke. I cannot understand it. Your head is a strange shape, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Not my head. It's the wig is too small. It is not too small. Mon Dieu, it is the biggest wig in France. It is the head that is too large. Well, what are you going to do? Mr. Dean says it's almost time to go. Monsieur, if you will sit still, I shall attempt once more. I am certainly not going to sit still. I have sat here long enough being tortured. And why? To fit over my head a monstrosity. A symbol of all the foolishness, the vanity, the inequality that pass here for civilization. Benny, look at that thing. A piece of canvas with six pounds of hair sewed on it. Put it on a man's head and you have an aristocrat. Yeah, throw it away. I suppose I'll have to go this way. How does it look? Why, Grandpa, you look much better that way. Monsieur, permit me to say... I have dressed the hair of noblemen for many years. But you, that way, with your white hair flowing back over your shoulders, you look more noble than any. A uh, nobleman of nature. Really? Well, well. It looks fine. <laughs> you know, if I go this way, Benny, I might even steal the show. I'll be the only man there in his own hair. Yes, go like that. This way you're more beautiful than Mr. Dean. Right, Benny, right. Why should I go like an imitation duke, a relic of medieval horrors? I go as an envoy from a new land, a land of free people, of men and women. I'm going as an American. <laughs> Thus was secured the greatest triumph of American diplomacy. The French alliance of 1778 foreshadowed the victory that won American freedom at Yorktown. And to the genius of the patriot who welded it belongs the tribute of the America that has arisen today. Benjamin Franklin, one of the mighty in the cavalcade of America. <laughs> Cavalcade of America thanks John McIntyre and the Cavalcade players for their performance of Dr. Franklin Goes to Court. And now the DuPont Company brings you its story from the wonder world of chemistry. This is the story of a plant at Deepwater, New Jersey on the Delaware River. A plant that never stopped growing. The cornerstone of the first little red brick building was laid 23 years ago in 1917. 
New buildings are still going up today. The place has grown so vast that names must be given its streets to keep visitors from getting lost. Construction has never stopped. For the first chapter of Deepwater's story, we go back to 1917. In 1917, the United States, utterly dependent on foreign manufacturers, found its stock of dye stuff so low that even the United States Post Office had to skimp on its colors in printing postage stamps. The DuPont dye plant at Deepwater was started then and is partly responsible for the fact that today, 95% of all the dyes we need are made in America. Then came automobile tires. In the early 20s, tires were expensive. One that ran 10,000 miles was something to brag about. Tire manufacturers were looking for ingredients that would give tires longer life. Chemists at Deepwater found them, and the plant grew. A little later, the automobile industry itself was faced with a problem. Could anything be added to the gasoline, engineers asked, that would make high-compression motors practical? The answer was found by the Ethyl Gasoline Corporation in tetraethyl lead, and more red brick buildings for its manufacture went up in the green park along the river's edge at deep water. After tetraethyl lead came man-made rubber. Half the nations of the world were searching for it. Deep water found it in neoprene. Then came electric refrigerators. The manufacture of Freon, the safe refrigerant, began at deep water, and still other buildings went up along the river's edge. A few more years passed, and with them came a new method developed by the petroleum industry to make better gasoline. However, this new gasoline reacted more readily with air to oxidize and form gummy compounds which fouled the valves and other parts of automobile engines. Chemists at Deepwater solved the problem by creating an antioxidant to prevent such deterioration and preserve the initial high fuel value of the better gasoline. And Deepwater grew further. So Deepwater, which employed 2,000 workers in 1925, today employs 5,700. One building has become 700 buildings. The 14 million pounds of product of 1920 have become the 168 million pounds of 1940. This is the story of Deepwater, a plant that has never stopped growing because America has never stopped growing. A plant that is a living embodiment of the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, on the night of January 5th, 1936, a company of radio players, including most of us here tonight, were broadcasting the 18th program in Cavalcade of America. In that cast was a young girl. To us, she was another very talented child actress. Today... Millions of moviegoers know her as Nancy Kelly. Next week, she returns to the Cavalcade of America, and we are proud to announce that she will be our star in a radio version of the Broadway Hollywood success, The Farmer Takes a Wife, by Frank B. Elser and Mark Connolly. It is a colorful drama of life on the old Erie Canal, one of the great milestones on America's march to the West. And on that occasion, the Cavalcade players are going to be very happy to have Nancy back with us again. Thank you. On the Cavalcade of America, your narrator, William Spargrove. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont maker of better things for better living through chemistry. To those men and women of science and industry who have created a civilization enriched with a thousand and one comforts of daily living, and to their spirit that we shall lead in the march of human progress, this performance of the Cavalcade of America is dedicated.
Cavalcade of America presents an original radio comedy, Dr. Franklin Takes It Easy, written by Eric Barno. A story of some of the amazing inventions of America's genial philosopher and beloved patriot, Benjamin Franklin, starring John McIntyre of the Cavalcade Players. Our Cavalcade Orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents John McIntyre as Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America. In his last years, Benjamin Franklin, one of the best-known men in the world, was living quietly in Philadelphia. He was over 80, happy in the midst of his family and writing long letters to his friends. Every afternoon, his little granddaughter, Deborah, came into his study, for he would help her with her lessons. Grandpa? Hmm? Oh, come in, come in. What are you doing? I'm working on something. Is it an invention? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, aren't you wonderful, Grandpa? Is it a new invention? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll show you. Why, it's nothing but a long stick. Yeah, well, it has two prongs on the end of it. You see them? Yes. Now, they're the secret. What are they for? Well, I'll show you how it works. It doesn't look like an invention. It is, though. Now, now, behold. Here, you see that book way up there on the top shelf? With the gold letters? That's right. Well, now, suppose I want that book. Shall I get you your chair that unfolds into a step ladder? Oh, no, we won't need that. Not now. But I like to see that work. That's a good invention. Ah, but, but look. Now, we, we hold the stick with the... Prongs right in front of the book. Like that, and then we go snap. It grabs the book. Like hang on. Uh, sure. Uh, 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 now it's just as if your old grandpa had an arm ten feet long. I just reach up the mechanical arm and grab a book anywhere I want. Oh, it's wonderful. You like that? Oh, yes. Are you going to make any more of them? Why, yes. I think I will. It'd be just what shopkeepers need. I'm sure they'll all want one. Then they can reach things from high shelves without any trouble. Yes. That's an idea, Debbie. We'll offer it to them. Oh, my. And, Grandpa, all the neighbors are using the chair that unfolds into a stepladder. Every house on the street has one. Indeed. And to think you invented that only a few months ago. <laughs> You're the most wonderful inventor. Uh, I'm not. You are, too. Everyone says so, and Mother says you're so industrious. Huh? No, I'm not a bit industrious. I'm just plain lazy. You are not. Yes, I am. I'm lazy. The laziest man you know. Why do you suppose I thought up this new invention? Other people don't mind walking up a stepladder six or eight times a day to get something off the shelf. But I hate it. Why, I'm so lazy, I invented a way of getting around it. Grandpa, how can you be so lazy if you work so hard? Why, just think of all those things you've made. All right, now, I didn't think of them. I'll tell you a secret. I don't tell anyone, Debbie. I invented them all for the same reason. All to save me a little bit of energy. Why, I'm probably just about the laziest man in the world. Grandpa, I won't let you say such things. The very idea. Did I ever tell you about my very first invention? Now, there's a good example. Was it your Franklin stove? No, no, no. That came years later. This is when I was just a lad up in Boston. Did you invent something then? Well, sort of. One day, another boy and I had gone swimming in a pond. Big pond, about a mile wide, on the edge of the town. Well, we'd been at it all day, and we were plain tired out. Then came time to start home back to Boston. 
Well, we were walking along the edge of the pond, and I got to wondering how long it ought to take us to get home. So we'd be in time for the supper. What Say, Ben, I wish we didn't have to walk all the way home. I'm stiff all over. Well, maybe a wagon will come along. Aren't you tired, too? Sure, Henry. I ache all over. Not a wagon in sight anywhere. Wait a minute, Henry. What's the matter? I have an idea about something. What? I want to fly my kite again. Fly your kite? Oh, what for? Come on, Ben, let's get on. No, I want to fly my kite. Look at that breeze. But let's get back to Boston. Oh, I'm tired out. You can wait a moment. Look at the kite shoot up. Look at it go. Oh, I don't care about that kite. Henry, hold it for a minute, will you? Now what? Just hold it. No, all right. That's it. I'll only be a second. What are you getting undressed for, Ben? Going to take another swim. A swim? We've been swimming all day and it's late. Oh, come on. We better be getting back or we'll get a caning. Here, Henry. Hold my coat, will you? I'm going into the pond. What are you doing with the kite? You'll see. As soon as I tie it around my wrist, then I float like this. Ben! Ben, the kite's pulling you along. Sure it is, Henry. Well, that's the idea. Hey, take my clothes with you. I'm riding back. Goodbye, Henry. Meet me on the other side. Now, you see, Debbie? I had it even then, my incurable laziness. <laughs> A lot of fun it was, too. Only Henry lost one of my stockings on his way back. Now, Grandpa, how can you keep saying you're lazy? Why, you made up so many good mottos about how people should be industrious all the time. Mm, I hope you've learned my mottos, Debbie. Oh, yes. We have them on our almanac at school. September was, lost time is never found again. Mm -hmm. And October was, the sleeping fox catches no poultry. Well, uh, uh, no. Making up mottos is the kind of work I like. You don't have to get out of an easy chair for that. You mustn't say things like that. Remember what you did with those musical glasses in London. Oh, my harmonica. Yes, Grandpa, and your stove, and all your other inventions. Yeah, well, now, you take that harmonica, Debbie. I'll tell you about that. That's a good point. You see, I was in London once, trying to change some laws that weren't fair to the colonies. I wasn't very successful, but I did stay in a nice, cheerful house where an English family and their daughter looked after me. Well, they spoiled me, fed me tremendously, and I, I became the lord of the household. Well, one day we were having a jolly dinner. What? What was that noise? My mother had sounded right in this room. Shh. Strange. Spirits, do you think? Well, it does sound in this room, but where? Maybe ghosts. I'm going to look in that cupboard. Oh, Mother, it can't be in there. Oh, where are all my glasses? Well, Mother, what is it? My glassware is gone. All my best dinner glass is gone. Oh, it's impossible. Oh, the <coughs> ones on the table, they must have been stolen. Uh, let me reassure you. Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what have you been up to? Uh, let me explain, Mrs. Martin. You see this uh, glass on the table? Yes. Well, when the rim of a fine glass is wet and the finger is passed gently around the rim, we get... Hmm. Notice it's difficult to tell where the sound comes from? Yes, it seems all around us. And you were doing it under our noses. Notice further that this glass has a slightly higher pitch than the first one. <laughs> Why? Because it has less water in it. Now, where is all my glassware? Well, if you ladies will step into the next room. Their concert is about to begin. <laughs> 
Mother, look at that table. All my 36 glasses in a long row. Now, ladies, you'll notice I have water at various levels in these glasses, enabling me to produce all the tones in the musical scale. Now, what would you like? A Scottish air? A minuet? What amuses you? Mr. Franklin, are you going to run up and down that long table to play on those glasses? Have I eaten so prodigiously in this house that the very thought of my running is laughable? Oh, Mr. Franklin. Now, <laughs> it is a Scottish air. Uh, Mr. Martin, your glassware is safe. Nothing will be broken. Well... you think so? Debbie, you remember these funny spectacles I invented? Yes. What are they for? Well, I used to have to use two pairs, one for reading and writing and one for distant prospects. But I like to look out of the window now and then while I'm working, and it vexed me dreadfully to have to change my spectacles all the time. I was always putting on one pair of spectacles and taking off another. Well, I got so exasperated, I invented these. Those funny ones? Well, not funny when you have to wear them, Debbie. You see, each lens has two different focuses. The lower part is for reading, upper part for distance. Now I don't have to change spectacles at all. My, I just don't understand. Grandpa, you say you're lazy, but I see you walking all the time. You're always making something, and Mother says you used to spend just hours and days working on electricity. Well, now, Debbie, that's a long, roundabout story. All those electrical bottles and batteries and everything? Well, I can explain that all right. Did anyone ever tell you about the electric Christmas party we had one year? No. Well, that's a good place to begin. One day, we invited our neighbors and friends for a demonstration. But it was also a party, an electricity party. <laughs> Friends? Friends? Since this is an electrical Christmas party, we shall roast our turkey by an electrical jack. Over a fire, we shall now kindle by the electrical bottle. Afterwards, a plum pudding with a flaming sauce ignited by electricity. Now, here you see our equipment. Doesn't it look dangerous? It is dangerous, madam. Extremely dangerous. 
I better step back there, young man. I want to be close. Uh, young man, it's a good idea not to be too intimate with this apparatus unless you've had a good deal of experience with it. I caution you all to be very careful not to touch these two knobs at the same moment. Uh, 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 what would happen if we did? Uh, well, I haven't experimented. It hardly seems wise. Step back, Tommy. Let me see, Mama. All right, we're ready to proceed. Now, the electrical fluid will leap from this knob here across this gap, igniting the tinder for our fire. But will we see anything? A flash of electrical fire. Now then, we take the other knob and carefully touch... Oh! Oh! Mr. Dykstra! Mr. Dykstra! Mr. Dykstra! Must have been the electric fire. Look at him, look at him. He's all blue. Mr. Dykstra! Mr. Dykstra! Step back, everybody. Let him breathe. Oh, dear. His heart's still beating. I can hear it. Stand back, please. I want to see. Oh, he'll be all right in a moment, I'm quite sure. Uh, Mr. Franklin... Uh, Mr. Franklin, can you hear me? Mr. Franklin! This is what comes of meddling with supernatural things. Uh, yes. Mr. Franklin! Oh. Can you hear us, Mr. Franklin? No, uh, uh, are you all right? No, friends, we take the knob. Uh, you've already done that, Mr. Franklin. That's why you're down on the floor now. Oh. Yes? Mm. Where am I? You're all right. You're just resting a moment. You've just had a severe shock. Oh, oh yes. You're all blue, Mr. Franklin. The uh, blood will come back in a moment, I believe. Uh, there was quite a flash, sir. Uh, such a noise. Don't try to get up, Mr. Franklin. Just sit there. Did it hurt? Uh, what does it feel like? Uh, like, like being struck by lightning. I can imagine. As if I received a blow in every part of my body. Lightning. That's it. Did you say there was a flash? Oh, yes, sir. Did and you get and it? a noise like thunder. And smell that smell. You notice a sulfurous odor when the flash occurred? Oh, yes. Oh, I thought so. Similar to the one in the thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. Friends, this supports a notion of mine that's been hounding me for weeks. If electricity and lightning really are the same, then we're on the verge of some knowledge very important. Now, forgive me for interrupting our electric Christmas party with this unseemly performance. Help me up. So it was the most vivid demonstration, Mr. Oh, it was very exciting. And frightening. And perhaps not uninstructive. Lightning and electricity. There's a common connection there. And I'm going to track it down the next thunderstorm. Mr. Franklin... Yes? What are we going to do with the turkey? Oh, oh Tommy. Oh. Oh. Cook it in the usual way. <laughs> Hurry, son. The storm's coming closer. Be careful of the kite. But do we have to bring this? Of course. It's the basis of the whole experiment. I just hope none of the neighbors see us. Why, what's the matter? Flying a kite at your age? They'll think that we're not right in the head. Well, don't worry so much about people's opinions, son. It may prove something today that philosophers throughout the world are trying to learn. Uh, turn here into this meadow. Well, it's starting to rain. All right, let the kite up now as quickly as you can. There it goes. Flying up fast. All right, we're going to that shed there. I've got the apparatus all ready. I want you to take care of the kite, son. Here, give me the end of the line. I have to attach this key to it. Now, if, if we get a spark there, does that mean that lightning is electricity? Exactly. Is the kite far up? Yeah, yeah. All right. I've got the key attached. There's a large thundercloud coming over. Good. Anything happening? No. No. That's a great cloud. No sparks yet. It may be that the line isn't wet enough. Why, what, what would that do? Well, the string is not a conductor, but water is, so the string won't conduct the electricity until it's thoroughly soaked. Hey, look. See? What is it? The strands of hemp are standing on end, bristling up. Look. Sparks. 
The electric fluid's flowing through. We've proved it, son. We've proved it. I guess you remember the rest, Demi. Once I'd proved that, I knew how to save thousands of people's homes and churches and public buildings from being struck by lightning. Lightning rods. Lightning rods to conduct the electric fluid into the ground. Did you invent the lightning rod out of laziness too, Grandpa? Of course, of course. You think I'm joking, don't you? I don't know. No, I'm not. Not exactly. With lightning rods, I made a lot of people's lives safer and more comfortable. You know, I organized the fire department here in Philadelphia. Whenever any home was struck by lightning, we'd rush out with our leather buckets to try and save lives and property, often too late. Now, when a thunder gust comes in the middle of the night, you wake up for a moment and think, Hmm, doesn't that sound good? And then you can go back to sleep again, don't you? I like to hear it thunder when I'm in bed. Mm, most people do, nowadays, because now they're safe. And so I did my bit to help everybody be a little lazy. You don't really mean lazy, do you? <laughs> you understand. Yeah, I thought you did. You know, I think... People are very important, don't you? You're important. Everybody's important. Much too important to well, spend their time climbing up and down ladders all day. Why, that kind of thing makes a man a slave. And he's not a slave, Debbie. Because, well, man can invent things to do those jobs for him. You mean you can, Grandpa? Well... Debbie, in all my inventions, I was trying to make man free of drudgery. To give men freedom. That's the important thing. So they could go on and make a better world. Well, Grandpa, if that happened, nobody would have anything to do. They'd all be like the princes in the storybooks. They'd be better than princes. They'd be masters of everything in the material world. Yes, I believe that. I believe that. Well, now it's time we got around to your lesson, isn't it? Well, if you like. Now, what do we have to do today? I have to spell words for my New England primer. Mm-hmm. Let's see that list. All right, let's hear you spell some of these words. Ah, now, here's one. One of my favorite words. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? That's easy. T O M O R R O. A jack of all trades, a master of all. A brilliant mind that immeasurably enriched our American way of life. An amazing genius for invention dedicated to freedom and to the prosperity and happiness of our nation and its people, for which he labored all his life. The most American of us all, Benjamin Franklin, the many-sided genius in the cavalcade of America. The Cavalcade of America thanks John McIntyre and the Cavalcade players for their performance of Dr. Franklin Takes It Easy. And now Ray Collins of the Cavalcade players to tell you about next week's program. Ladies and gentlemen, next week the Cavalcade of America presents a radio play, Henry Clay of Kentucky. 
The story of the man remembered for his great slogan, No South, No North, No East, No West. And who said, I'd rather be right than president. Admiring any man who fought for unity in America as he did, I am happy to play the part of Henry Clay when Cavalcade comes to you next week. Thank you. The part of Deborah on this program was played by Sarah Fussell. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company. We will bring you General Benjamin Franklin, starring Charles Lawson with Kathleen Lockhart on The Cavalcade of America. But first, here is Gaines Whitman for DuPont. Throughout the country, there are thousands of DuPont authorized refinishers, body repair, and paint shops. They are specialists in smoothing out bumps and dents that mar the good looks of your car, in cleaning up rust spots along the door jams, window, and cowl dents, where the old finish is worn out. These shops put on a factory match finish in DuPont Duco or Dulux so perfectly, you won't be able to find the places that have been repaired. Look at your car tomorrow. If it needs a touch-up or overall paint job, take it to the DuPont authorized refinisher before the rain and snow of winter cause more rust and corrosion. Duco and Dulux finishes are among the DuPont company's better things for better living through chemistry. The Pony Express. The Covered Wagon. America, the Jet Propelled Plane. America means skyscrapers and haylofts, the crack of a pioneer's flintlock, and the sound of a riveter's machine. The glow of a fireside and the glare of a blast furnace against the midnight sky. America is your story. America is you and everyone you know. Tonight, the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Charles Lawton with Kathleen Lockhart in General Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America. It is late at night in the stately Philadelphia mansion of Robert Hunter Morris, His Majesty's colonial governor for the Crown Colony of Pennsylvania. In his study, the governor reads over a letter he has just composed to the most distinguished American of that day. To Benjamin Franklin, Esquire, the French and Indian declaration of war has brought terror to the western border of Pennsylvania. Your appointment as a member of our committee for defense entitles you to know that at length His Gracious Majesty has been pleased to order General Edward Braddock and a force of British regulars to our rescue. It is hereby directed by request that you the I directed by request that you repair to Frederick Town, Maryland, before an earliest possible meeting with General Braddock. Believe me, sir, your most obedient servant, Robert Hunter Morris, Governor. Oh, Ben, you didn't even listen to me read this letter from the Governor. Pompous windbag. Fifteen words where one would suffice. Then what are you doing? Building a coffin. What? Building a coffin. What a horrible thing to say. Not at all, Debbie, it's true. Quite a creditable job. Ben Franklin, you may be a wit of the assembly, but I'll not have you testing your sayings on me. I love you, Debbie. Not for the world would I use your beautiful head as a sounding block. Ah, there, done. 
A little paint and Mistress Katie will be pleased, I'm sure. Mistress Katie, then? What are you saying? Now, what about Mistress Katie? That's not for her. Oh, no. It's for her squirrel. Oh, now then. Begin at the beginning. It's for her pet squirrel, my dear. Died last night. Our attempts to doctor it were unsuccessful. So that's where you were until after midnight, <laughs> doctoring a squirrel. Debbie, to little Mistress Katie, the squirrel was more than a pet. It was a way of life. The center of an orbit round which Katie's existence moved. Oh, Ben. With things the way they are, with the French and the Indians threatening our very homes, you stay up until all hours doctoring a squirrel for a neighbor's child. Would you have me any other way, Debbie? Of course not, dear. But now, what about this letter? Oh, I suppose I shall have to take a coach to Fredericktown and meet General Braddock. What's the time? Where's your watch? Watch? Oh, uh, I took it apart. I'd forgotten. Again? <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You can take the evening coach. You'll have plenty of time, but you'd better get tidied up. This suits all right, my dear. Is that all wrong, thing? Mm -hmm. You're going to meet a general, then. I am sure the general will be splendid enough for both of us, my dear. <clears throat> now I've got to hurry. Where's the where's wetsuit? Here, where you threw it. On the floor. Thank you. <laughs> now what are you hurrying uh, for? You've got till this evening. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. The funeral set for two o'clock. I promised Katie we should have a grand funeral. General Braddock, sir, this is Mr. Benjamin Franklin. I am honored, sir. My honor, General. Well, that'll be all, Captain. Yes, sir. You were delayed, Mr. Benjamin? Delayed? Oh, no, no, no. The coach was on time. Oh. Will you sit down? Thank you. Now from the jar, Mr. Franklin. Yes, if you please, sir. Your health, sir. Thank you. Uh, General Braddock, as a member of the Defense Committee, I am here to place myself at your service. <laughs> Franklin, you're a civilian. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but a successful military campaign requires a scientific knowledge of professional soldiers. Forgive me, sir, but the art of war is a life's work. The time were better spent in the science of avoiding war, General. <clears throat> yes, that may be, but we have war now. The king has ordered me here with two line regiments to sweep the French and their Indian allies from the Ohio. I propose to get on with it. I propose, sir, to help you in any way I can. Good. My idea was to raise a volunteer army, a militia of citizens. Citizens? You mean farmers, trappers, tradesmen and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, better than nothing, I suppose. On the contrary, sir, not only do we Americans believe that a man fights better for his own soil than an imported soldier would, but our militiamen know the enemy. I venture to say that the skilled might of His Majesty's forces will prevail. Gad, sir, an Indian is merely a man with a musket, after all. Or a man with arrows, sir. Arrows are silent. In the forest, they come from nowhere. At any rate, sir, I plead with you not to send your columns into the forests in mass array, wearing those scarlet coats of theirs. Some of us have learned valuable lessons from Indian fighting. You know our general, uh, our colonel, Sir George Washington, of course, sir. I suggest you rely on his advice. I think you said he was a colonel. Yes, uh, yes, yes, I see, uh, General. Yes, I see the point all too clearly. Then see this clearly, if you will, sir. My orders are from the king. I am to attack and destroy Fort Duquesne and the enemy there. I have my regulars and I'm in command. Colonel Washington says... He is not in command. Uh, um, Franklin. Yes, sir. Perhaps if you were a soldier, you would understand these matters. Oh, by the way, were you ever a soldier? Oh, yes, I was one. Oh, it's good, excellent. Where did you serve, sir? I uh, took my turn at sentry duty during King George's War some years ago. Sentry duty? What was your rank, Mr. Franklin? Common soldier, General. I see. But you were, of course, in combat. I seem to remember having seen muskets fired, sir, or heard them, but as for coming to a brush with the enemy, I cannot claim that. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a responsible position, General. I guarded some cannon Governor Clinton had mounted. Uh, the cannon were loaded. I think. Oh, <laughs> come, Clinton. Don't be so serious. This is only going to be a skirmish at best. Indians may be a formidable enemy to you colonials, but are the king's regular and disciplined troops? I should say. Very well, General Braddock. I pray, of course, for the entire success of your expedition. <laughs> Oh, 
More than half of them. Killed. Destroyed. I knew it, Debbie. I knew it. It wasn't your fault, dear. You did all you could. If he'd only listened to Washington, I can't blame him for disregarding my advice. I'm not a soldier, and I never will be. Now, but Washington... Now, sit down, dear. Now, what's to be done? I don't know, Debbie. Then you'd better eat something. I don't want anything, now, my dear. I've got to go and see Governor Morris. What good will that do? You've talked to him before, and he's never been enthusiastic about your defense plan. Well, he's got to be now, now that the Indians are breathing down his neck and back said, along with half of his force. Mm, this could be left to the younger men, dear. You'll be 50 soon. Debbie, we are defending our own homes in 50 or 150. I can't stop now. I'm going to see Governor Morris. And if he doesn't see eye to eye with me this time, I'll... I'll now, I'll... now, don't quarrel with him, dear. I have the greatest respect for Governor Morris. <laughs> Begging your pardon, Governor Morris. Benjamin Franklin is here to see you. Franklin? What does he want again? I don't know, Your Excellency. Oh, this man's more trouble than the Indians. He had a good plan, sir. I'll be the judge of that. Oh, I'll have him come in. Yes, sir. Ah, Franklin, come in, come in. Your Excellency, I'm delighted to see you again. Thank you. I'm glad to see you. Dreadful thing, Franklin. Dreadful thing, Braddock's defeat. It was more than that, Your Excellency. Huh? What do you mean? It was the end of our protection. The people, sir, are demanding protection. Well, what can I do? Braddock was a good general. He was an excellent general and an extremely courageous man, but that was not enough. Well, what can I tell the people? What you intend to do, of course, sir. Um, well, yes, of course. Um, yes, Your Excellency. Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, confounded, Franklin, don't just sit there. What do you suggest? Volunteer militia, Your Excellency. These people aren't fighters. General Braddock's regulars were picked troops. Where are they now? It's absurd. I don't think so. These men will be fighting for their homes for America. I, I haven't got the right to authorize the organizing of militia. The proprietor isn't here. No, he's in London. Isn't there another plan? Yes, yes, there is another plan. We can sit quietly and let the Indians scalp us while we sleep. That would solve our problems. It would also necessitate recolonizing, sir. Oh, how can you joke at a time like this? Believe me, Excellency, I am not joking. Either we organize militia and defend ourselves, or we give up America. And I, for one, do not intend to do that. All right, all right, militia, then. Good. I'll inform the assembly. Oh, uh, uh, just a moment. Since you're the originator of this plan, I think you should stay with it. What were you? Uh, the expedition is going to need a leader. Yes. A man experienced, well liked, popular. We'll find someone. I, uh, I don't think there's a need to look further, Mr. Franklin. You're not talking about me, sir. I am. Well, I, I am no soldier. If I appoint you, you will be. Appointing me doesn't make a soldier of me. I have no head for battle. I'm, I'm a man of peace. You were all for action a moment ago. I still am, but action led by someone who is capable, sir. You know that I'm no soldier, Your Excellency, and I know it too. Takes other hands than those that fire the musket to preserve this promising land of ours. So consider yourself appointed. A successful campaign may require a general. That's a excellent a general, Mr. Franklin. Um, is this um, an order, Your Excellency? Considering so, no, Mr. Franklin. And I can do nothing else but heaven help the campaign. <laughs> listening to Charles Lawton as Ben Franklin and Kathleen Lockhart as Debbie in General Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As the second part of our story opens, Benjamin Franklin has convinced Governor Morris that recruiting volunteer militia is the only means of defending the colony of Pennsylvania. However, Franklin did not count on being appointed leader of the expedition, and just now we find him at his headquarters. Will someone please poke up the fire? Yes, General. And stop calling me General. Yes, sir. Uh, General Franklin, sir. Lieutenant, don't shout from the door. Close it and come in. Yes, sir. Well, what's the trouble with you? Uh, sir, I, I think the rain is going to turn to snow. Is that your opinion? I have you dispatch runners reporting from Jupiter Pluvius. Well, I... I thought you ought to know. Now that I do know, what can I do about it? Uh, uh, nothing, sir. Exactly. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, just a moment, Lieutenant. Sir? Uh, thank you for telling me. 
You must forgive an old man his testiness and ill temper. Soldiering is not in my order of things, you know. Of course, sir. You're wet. You sit by the fire and warm yourself. But I, I have work. You'll not be able to do it. If you come down with cold and fever, sit by the fire, Lieutenant. Why? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there never was a good war or a bad peace. I must speak to you. For the grief, Captain McLaughlin, you do not stand by the door shouting at me. Huh? We shall have to move immediately. Oh, why? Well, the snow will make the trails impassable. And we must reach a defensible position by dawn. Yes, very well. We'll move. Hey, yes, sir. Where are those camphor balls? Right here, sir. Camphor balls, General? Yes, Captain McLaughlin. My dear wife made me take them along to prevent me catching cold. Oh, I see, sir. They smell horrible. They do, sir. However, if they do not prevent the cold, they will serve one purpose. One purpose, sir? What is that? These camphor balls will keep any Indians off, provided the savage ru- savages are upwind from it. Ah, this is a comfortable house, Captain McLaughlin. Yes, sir, it is. A doubling it place. Now, I suppose we'll have to discuss this campaign. We will, sir. I have a map here of the region. Uh, uh, now, I... Uh... It looks as though we shall have to give battle before we reach Gnadenhutten. Well, yeah. Gnadenhutten. Oh, go on. Now, um, here's Gnadenhutten. Don't say that again. I can see it on the map. Yes, sir. Here's the path before Gnadenhutten. Yes, sir. Shall I go on? By all means. Thank you, sir. Now, if we get through the pass before dawn, we can reach Gnadenhutten. Just a moment, Captain. This pass is quite narrow, isn't it? Yes, General. It would take us quite a while to move through it. Mm-hmm. But I think we can make it, sir. And if we didn't, we should be like the uh, Persians before the pass of Thermopylae. Persians, sir? Remember, Captain? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. The Greeks held off a large Persian force at Thermopylae. Ah, yes, you know your traffic. I doubt if the Indians have their Leonidas. But we should take no chance of being caught in the pass, flanked from all sides. But we must reach the Naval Houston. Captain, order Captain Isaac Wayne to move his company to the left. Wide of the pass. Uh, Captain Fook to move to the rear. Captain Weatherholt to move up ahead. And your own attachment to stay well to the right. But, General, we are here. Entirely unprotected. We shall keep a hundred men. A hundred? But against all those exactly. Indians? Exactly. I hope to make the Indians commit the main body of their force to an attack here. Well, I... It may work. It may not. Sir? You have something to add to this plan? Nothing, sir. He accepts it without question. You're my commander, sir. You think I'm a madman, Captain? No, sir. Your military bearing, Captain, is second only to your tact. What time is it, Captain? I'm a few minutes before dawn, sir. Uh The Indian believes that if he dies before dawn, his spirit will not go to the happy hunting grounds. We have a few minutes. Are there any orders for me, sir? I don't think so, Captain. You'd best remain here. Here? In the house? While my company listen to that. There's the crack of dawn, Captain. I knew it. The Indians are attacking us here. They are. Let's hope it's the main body of their forces. And if it is, we'll never get back to Philadelphia, sir. Double Franklin, sir. The Indians attacking. Any orders? Fire back at them, Lieutenant. Those are all the orders, sir? They seem to be sufficient for the moment. Isn't that so, Captain McCarkin? Lieutenant. Have our men form a circle around the house. Wagons and equipment to be piled as barricades. Yes, sir. I should have thought of that, Captain. You knew we were in a trap here, didn't you, sir? I had some idea of it, yes. Have you a musket, sir? Musket? I don't think so. You're counting on our other companies to hear the fighting and close in. Isn't that it, General? That was in the mind, yes. Uh, they don't get here in time. If it's any comfort at all, Captain, Benjamin Franklin will die with you. Do you see any of the Indians? Yeah. Behind every tree and rock, but I... I can't see him. Sit down, Captain. Sit, sit down? Well, we're committed to this. If it works, well and good. If it doesn't, we may as well meet the thing calmly. Sit down, Captain. Sit down! down, Ben Franklin, and keep your feet in that hot tub. The big toe is floating, floating right off my foot, Tabby, blister and all. <laughs> Just a little while, it'll float right back on again. Yeah. <laughs> now move your feet up to the one side, or this hot water will scald you. Ow! That water's too hot, Debbie. Mmm, fine soda. 
I never know how you survived all those weeks in the field. And the birthday, too. Yes, I know. You're past 50 now. I hope you'll begin to act your age. You do try to forget my age, Debbie, if only to save yourself by comparison. I heard all about it, Ben Franklin. What an utterly hot, foolhardy thing to do. Now, 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 Debbie. It's all over and done. Oh, but you might have been killed. Well, yes, there was a possibility. Possibility? You deliberately had those savages attack you. It's an old maneuver, my dear, for which I take no credit. I, I believe that Julius Caesar used it several times. I think it was a favorite trick of Alexander the Great. Ben know. Franklin, you're neither Julius Caesar nor Alexander the Great. I grant it, my dear Debbie. I'm not a gentleman of the sword, but rather of the pen. Where's the brown suit? I got rid of it. Debbie, that was a shabby trick. I loved that suit. Oh, Ben, Ben. You risked your life, and all you think about is that old suit. It was comfortable. It was a disgrace to the deputy postmaster and the general. Well, I'm not a general, Debbie, and I never was. It turns out that my appointment was as a colonel in the Philadelphia Regiment. And just as well. Debbie, my feet aren't made for marching. Oh, it's a wonder they wouldn't give you a horse. They did, but the horse and I were at odds as to when I should go up and come down. <laughs> so I marched. Now, who's that at this hour? Don't answer it, my dear. Don't be a goose. Might be important. Nothing is important but peace and quiet. Debbie, who is it? Debbie? The message to you, dear. Oh, open it, dear. Oh, no. No. What is it? Send me, send me the message you to sail for England. What? Let me see that. Agent for Pennsylvania. Then you can't do it. You've just come back from that campaign. Then tell him you can't accept. But you won't accept. Let the younger men do it. My age favors me this time, Debbie. You've done your share, dear. Do you want me to stop, Debbie? You, in England. Well, you'll need a new suit. A brown one. If you like. <laughs> hey, Debbie, now, Debbie, 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 Debbie. None of that now. Oh. Done what you could, Ben? No, I, I don't think so. I know now that men war upon each other, not knowing the reason, and you know that too, Debbie? I do, Ben, but you're only one man. One man from a new world, Debbie. Maybe, Debbie, maybe I can bring some of the hope for the peace of the new world to this, this to the distracted old world. Year in and year out, Europe seeds. New struggles for questionable ends. Men are too prone to put their squabbles to the test of fire. There never was a good war, nor a bad peace. moment, our star, Charles Lawton, will return. But first, here is Jane Whitman speaking for DuPont. When your mother was a girl and went to the grocery to buy, let's say, soda crackers, the grocer man shooed the cap off the cracker barrel, reached down and handed the crackers over the counter in a paper sack. Most foodstuffs, and a good many other things, too, used to be sold in bulk. Packaging was developed by American business for a number of reasons. Cleanliness, convenience, accurate weight, and one last reason that's the most important of all, branding. When an American manufacturer prints his brand name on a package in big, bright letters, he is bidding for your attention, asking you to buy his product. But his brand is also a pledge. Also... If the product satisfies you, you buy that brand again. If it displeases you, you give it a cold look and a cold shoulder. A branded product, competing with many others, has to be good if the maker wants to stay in business. Women use the same brand of baking powder their mothers used because they know they can depend on it. 
Men buy the same make of car year after year, and competition is always there to keep the maker of that car on his toes. If you have ever traveled in a foreign country, you'll remember how glad you were to find a box of face powder or a pair of shoes with a familiar American brand on it. There was something you knew, something you could trust. The rules of good business never change. Hundreds of years ago, people bought from the makers whose products gave them better service. We all do the same thing today. A brand on the products we buy is a modern device that helps us to make our choice quickly and conveniently. Only a few of the many products of DuPont chemical science reach you directly. By far, the greater number of DuPont compounds are sold to manufacturers who use them in making the products which they in turn sell to you. But every one of the thousands of boxes, barrels, and bags leaving a DuPont plant, whether it goes to you or goes to industry, carries the DuPont brand that stands for a century and a half of experience and integrity in the manufacture of the DuPont company's better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> As some of you may perhaps remember, a year or so ago I had the pleasure of acting a quite different aspect of Benjamin Franklin's life than the one you've heard tonight. For Benjamin Franklin, the soldier, was quite a new idea for me, as I imagine it was for most of us. The pattern for winning liberty has never been set. When the time comes, free men are able to take part freely in the battle for the beliefs they cherish. We see it today, Franklin saw it in his time. Calling, vocation, even age, is no barrier to service. Cavalcade brings you Brian Donlevy in the old Fall River Line. It's the romantic and nostalgic story of one of America's most colorful enterprises, the Fall River Line. The first stop on every traveler's list, from presidents to foreign diplomats and visiting celebrities. It's the story of Dan Hamilton, who fell in love with a boat on this famous line when he was 14 and spent the rest of his days ferrying boats across the old Fall River Line. You'll also hear Harry Von Tilsey's popular song about this thrilling boat trip. Be sure to listen next Monday to The Old Fall River Line, starring Brian Donlevy. Benedict Bogus production, A Miracle Can Happen. The music for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our Cavalcade play was written by Zachary Metz. In the cast were George Zucco, Joseph Kern, William John Stone, Junius Matthews, Jay Novello, Howard Duff, and Raymond Lawrence. This is John Easton inviting you to listen next week to Brian Donlevy in The Old Fall River Line on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.